Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. My name is Matt Anderson, the Chief Growth Officer at the Space Force Association. And today we continue our Space Warfighter Talks with the Commander of Space Delta Nine, Colonel Mark Bigley. Sir, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We, uh, we know that there's been a lot in the news lately. There's been a lot of um, excitement in the space domain throughout the past few years. And before we kick, kick this thing off with the official agenda, we have a lot of our viewers that are out there. There's, you know, junior ROTC, ROTC, Air Force Academy cadets, a lot of uh, high school students looking at enlisting in the in the Space Force. Absolutely. And as our nation looks at uh, retention, recruiting, and all those different goals, you have a pretty cool background that we wanted to talk about. And I just want to pick your brain a little bit. Can you tell our audience a little bit where, where you were at in high school, where that took you, where your decisions were, and how it led you to ultimately Virginia Tech? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, I guess to start with, you know, I was a military brat. Um, so I think um, that's common for a lot of families to have a military connection. And whether you do or not, there's often you get this Around high school, you feel that pull in the military service. Uh, Virginia Tech has a core of cadets, so that was another draw as well to go to a program where I could be part of a military uh, uh, core and ROTC at the same time. So that was a draw to Virginia Tech. Uh, but I, as I went through from high school into college, you know, I ended up commissioning in 2002. So that's a year after 9/11. Um, so I can I can tell you pretty clearly that what I what I thought I was doing in high school going into college versus what the world was when I commissioned. A very different place. Um, and actually, I feel confident saying that it's continued to change ever since. Um, so it's a very dynamic world environment. Uh, but what I think what always kept me centered was, um, you know, first wanting to serve. I mean, our school motto of Virginia Tech is that I may serve. So service to country was a was a prime uh, a reason for joining any military. Of course, I first came into the Air Force, like all, all guardians of uh, my age anyway. Um, so I came into the Air Force, uh, had had a great career. Um, and moving into the Space Force was a natural progression for me to continue with my, my space background. Uh, but really, the, you know, the camaraderie, um, uh, the shared uh, values and purpose, um, it's great not having to pick out different clothes every day, so the uniform helps. Um, but it was it was really that common sense of, of the unity of purpose, the ability to serve the nation was really the biggest role. Yeah, I share that with you. My dad was, a, I was an Air Force brat as yeah. well. And, uh, I think we are... We are dipping in, fishing in the same pond a whole lot. We're trying to, our recruiting professionals are trying to get outside that a little bit. But I think a lot of us share that common bond. And congratulations, by the way, Virginia Tech reached out to you and they asked you to come out. And yep. can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, very excited to uh, working right now with the uh, detachment commander at 875 at Virginia Tech. I'm hoping to be able to go back there in April um, to be a guest during one of their dining outs for an anniversary celebration. Um, so it, and it goes by in the blink of an eye, to, uh, you know, think that 22 years has gone by is incredible. Um, but to be able to go back, not just to your alma mater, but to go see the detachment, uh, to see, uh, the cadets in the same phase of their training that I was in is going to be, it's, it's going to be emotional, but it's going to be awesome at the same time, uh, to see that passion, the excitement, um, same excitement that I see when we visited BNT to see the guardian classes, same excitement we see when we have new folks arrive from Vanderburg for training. Um, we, we are attracting some of the best talent in the country, and they're all super excited to come into the Space Force, not just for the mission, but also for all the things I mentioned, the values, uh, but to be on the cutting edge of, of space operations and technology and to be able to do all the amazing things that you want to be able to do, not just as someone who's serving your country, but also to push the boundaries of what's possible in space. Um, I'm excited to bring that message back to the cadets. I'm excited to be able to um, carry that message through the service we have now in Delta 9, uh, but to be able to continue to generate that excitement and the attraction to the service. Yeah, we at SFA get a lot of questions on, hey, if I want to join the Space Force, what should I major in? What should I be studying in high school? And all they often hear is STEM. But mm -hmm. uh, as we've done a lot of these interviews, we see from General Saltzman to all the way to the most, um, the newest guardians, the academic backgrounds vary quite a bit. But yours is pretty awesome as well. Can you yeah. tell about your undergrad, your master's degrees, and just kind of sure. give them a little vector where you came from? Right. So when I um, when I was looking at military service, of course, a lot of us in high school and college were still trying to figure out what we're doing with our lives. Um, I was intending actually to go into um, a medical field of some sort, including um, medical in the in the Air Force. So I studied biochemistry, um, which uh, has a lot of different applications. But I have I've always had a passion for life sciences. So I, there was a point at which I was going to study epidemiology, which not knowing that COVID was going to happen would have been a different career path. Uh, you know, 20 years prior. Um, but I studied biochemistry and I had a very deep science background. Uh, but when I commissioned the Air Force, um, I think one of the important thing to understand is that your degree and your academic background is really what's setting you up from a core competency perspective. The service will look at those and it'll determine where, where those skills are best utilized. I took a 
pretty much a, a aggressive tact over to uh, to work in the ICBM business. So I was I did nukes for a couple of years um, before I came back into space, um, moving from the ICBM community into space through the weapons schoolhouse at Nellis. Uh, that uh, really took my career in a couple of different paths, but that's part of the excitement, at least for me, is to know that um, one of the ways we develop people uh, across all military services is we train you for what you need to know. We develop your skills. We look for potential and we continue to advance you based on what you're good at. Um, and everyone finds a path in that. And I think um, the Air Force absolutely did that for me. It opened a lot of doors for me. It took me in places I probably would not have considered. Um, but I've really I've enjoyed every opportunity I've had, every school I've gone to. If, um, as you mentioned, you know, getting the opportunity for additional masters. I had a master's in space studies I did through a civilian university. Uh, they got another master's in uh, national security studies through the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. So you have a lot of different opportunities that are open to you. And um, as long as you remain open to those possibilities and you you bring that same enthusiasm throughout every stage of your career, every assignment opportunity, you're going to continue to have a great time and you'll continue to progress and, and contribute, which is really what we all want to do. Yeah, you mentioned the weapons school mm -hmm. and the patch that you wear. And you share that with a lot of the general officers, not only Space Force, but Air Force. Um, some people try to try to equate it to Top Gun, but I really don't think that's given the weapons school a six month program, really a fair shake. Sure. And you get to wear that um, that badge of honor, but it also represents kind of where your brain is. And I think that's really unique with your current job with uh, mm -hmm. as Delta Nine commander. Can you talk about the weapons school? Sure. I know we recently had a conversation with Brigadier General Rick Face Goodman, the 57th Wing Commander out at Nellis. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about the investments they're seeing in space weapons officers mm -hmm. and coming out of the missile career field at the general, you know, when you got commissioned, where we are now, what you're seeing with these graduates, uh, just speak to that a little bit, if you would. Well, I think it's it's first to kind of just level set expectations. The patch in the schoolhouse, uh, what, what a lot of people don't see it written at the bottom is that these are, you're an instructor. Um, so the weapons instructor course, the WIC school, as it's called, um, is really that six months time you spend is not just developing deep system level understanding, but you leave there as an expert instructor. And the role of a patch is to be an instructor. It's to be a teacher, um, the, you know, the motto of the school is a build, teach, lead. Uh, you, know, you, you build tacticians, you build expertise, you teach that to the formations of which you're assigned, and you lead through things like mission planning, uh, you lead through um, uh, mission commander force packaging. Um, you, you're looked to as a subject matter expert, but also someone who can take a team of diverse talent and lead them through a tactical problem and to come to a solution. Um, you also learn that that's not a perfect science. Um, so one of the things we emphasize at the weapons school is that um, you have to be humble, approachable, and credible because you have to have the humility to know that you're not always going to get it right. And you have to learn from your mistakes. You have to debrief that. And you have to be better the next time you do it. You have to be approachable because if if wearing the patch means that you somehow believe that you're you're at a higher plane than other folks, um, that may make you less approachable for the exact audience that you need to reach. So you need to be approachable to the folks you're instructing to teach, to build uh, partnerships and camaraderie amongst those organizations. Uh, and credibility uh, is something that you can lose in a second if you don't take it seriously. So um, you have to know what you know and know what you don't know. Um, and you have to be a credible advisor to the people you're leading and to the leaders you're serving. So when you graduate from Nellis, your first assignment, what we call your tier one assignment, you know, you're typically working at a squadron level and you are you're doing a lot of teaching, but you're also one, you're often the senior tactical advisor to the commander, not just the squadron commander, but oftentimes the wing commander or in our case, the Delta commander. Um, and so the way I use our uh, patches, our weapons officers is, uh, yes, we use them extensively for training. They do, they're expert instructors and we use them to build tactics. We use them to lead mission planning cells. Um, but one of the things that they get from the school and get from their practice of how they apply that is they're great problem solvers and they are able to assimilate large amounts of information and come to a recommendation on how to be more uh, more effective in operations or more uh, uh, capable of executing complex operations that maybe we haven't seen before. Maybe it's a novel concept. Um, so those are the things you learn, but then when you put that into practice in the field over, you have a five year payback period and you're learning as you go and you're building uh, capacity as a weapons officer, but it's also within the community. Um, I think it's a, it's a way to take that contribution, again, going back to the idea of service. Um, it's just another way to um, take the, the knowledge that you have up to that mid, mid CGO point, uh, bring it up to another level, uh, and then to be even more of a contributing member to a broader group. You can bring more people along with you and you can teach and lead more people and it's an awesome experience. Now, I'm glad you brought up uh, the men and women of Delta Nine and the weapons officers role in there because 
it really brings us to the point of this interview, and that's talking about orbital warfare. Absolutely. And a little over four years ago when the Space Force was formed, um, you know, the nation was thinking about space power theory and doctrine, and Space Force said, hey, we have seven disciplines that we want to focus on, and one of those is orbital warfare. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of walk us through that? Absolutely. Uh, so it's important to start, I think, that the fact that we're sitting here having this conversation is unique, yeah. uh, because prior to the Space Force, you wouldn't hear orbital warfare together in one sentence. You certainly wouldn't have a commander of orbital warfare. You wouldn't have a unit dedicated to orbital warfare. So one of the things that the Space Force gave us was the ability to identify this as a core competency, to be able to or deliberately organize training and equip the personnel, the resources, the technology necessary to be effective for something that we have known for a long time we needed to focus on. I think uh, Air Force Space Command certainly knew that this was a, a competency that was important and we did dedicate resources to it. But to be able to, to come forward as a separate service with its own organizational structure dedicated to it is a significant public statement. It's also a significant statement of commitment. And what we're committed to what we focus on in Delta Nine is uh, is a couple of key tenets. You know, we we build um, competency and expertise in the orbital environment, uh, specifically orbital maneuver, um, how how you maneuver space objects. Uh, we build competency in how you apply what are common theories in other domains, such as the application of offensive and defensive fires, for example. Um, how do you take information of an adversary and you build uh, courses of action and you apply tactics, techniques, and procedures. Orbital warfare is a combination of, of those things that we can enable the core tenets of the service uh, to enhance drone lethality, to provide independent military options to national leadership, and to ensure freedom of access and maneuver in the space domain. And so when you have a mission area such as orbital warfare that's dedicated to developing those things, to developing, again, the people, the systems, the technologies, and the understanding, you're then able to protect and defend our assets. You're able to offer unique approaches for the on-orbit uh, competition environment we're in right now that could at some point transition into conflict, you have a way to offer those independent options. Uh, and then you have a way to um, develop the people necessary uh, to grow the mission area, uh, to make sure that we're uh, seeking the right technologies, uh, we're pursuing the right uh, policies and really being the champion for that across the service. That's important because I liked how you mentioned the joint warfighter part of this. Mm -hmm. Your background, your career clearly has a lot of joints sprinkled in there as do many of the general officers uh, in the Space Force at this time. And, you know, very recently, the Secretary Kendall is, is if you asked him a couple of years ago what his priorities were, he said, I have three, China, China, China. Mm -hmm. Really hasn't changed a whole lot. We're just seeing great power competition right now. Mm -hmm. uh, general Saltzman laid out a little bit of an organizational change last week that we're going to be looking at a Space Futures Command. Yeah. Uh, so a fourth field command within the Space Force. But he also started talking about within, you know, the Delta level and the squadron level, we're going to start talking about combat squadrons, mm -hmm. uh, how we present forces. General Doug Shess, you know, with Space Forces Space recently uh, stood up. And I thought he gave a great example because it was confusing to people at first. Mm -hmm. uh, as a missile early on, he said, hey, when I'm in the squadron, I'm thinking about readiness training like you always would do in a, a space operations command type role, um, organized training to equip. However, when I go to the alert facility, mm -hmm. I'm now working for a combatant commander in U.S. Stratcom. Mm -hmm. So... Can you tell us about how Delta Nine is organized when we hear all this talk about IMDs, uh, combat squadrons, and and then how your Delta works across Deltas and presents options to the joint force? That's a lot. But can you take us through that a little bit? Certainly. And it, it is a lot. And um, it can be easy to get lost in some of the, the changes uh, because we are, as General Salsman has said, we're, we're building a purpose-built service. Uh, and purpose-built in this case means that we are, um, and I'll, I'll take a, a step back to a bigger macro perspective for a second. Um, one of the things that the Space Force had early on as an advantage was we could be very focused. We could be very mission focused. Um, and, and you see that in how the Deltas are organized. So as a Del-9 commander, I'm focused exclusively on orbital warfare. Other Deltas have similar competencies they're focusing on. Um, within the Department of the Air Force, we uh, we rely on the Air Force to provide all those other things that make the military service operate. So so at, at Delta-9, on Shriver Space Force Space, I rely on Space Base Delta-1. Uh, who's, a, who's a different commander, different organization, uh, but they provide all the base services, the support necessary for us to operate from Schriever. So that mission focus is a great advantage that I have because I can just be focused on that one mission. Um, it also allows us to, to make some very clear prioritization decisions. So when we talk about optimization for great power competition or we talk about purpose building the service, um, really comes down to us as a readiness target. So the mission focus and the readiness focus that we have in all the deltas, but specifically in Delta 9, um, drives every action that we take. So 
within the organizational model that the service has today and what we're what we are continuing to optimize uh, with the rest of the department is really a readiness focused approach to how do you take the forces that we have been assigned um, so that's the that's not just personnel but also resources and equipment and how do you how do you bring those forces through deliberate phases of readiness development so that when we present forces back to the combatant command in this case US Space Command and General Whiting um, they are the most ready, the most effective, the most combat credible they can be to do the assigned mission. And that's where combat squadrons come in. So in Delta 9, we have uh, we have a host of units, um, and we can dive a little bit more into this, but think of them as we have core operational units, and we have some units that are doing things like tactics development, experimentation, and training. When you look at those core operational units, really what they're doing day to day is they are um, they have to spend time to understand, uh, which we call, is basically our mission analysis process. They analyze the mission that U.S. Space Command is going to assign them. So we understand what U.S. Space Command needs us to do, and we bring those objectives back into our readiness activities. And you can think of that as training exercises, um, uh, threat, uh, threat awareness, intelligence development, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and we prioritize a time to do those readiness activities. Um, what all services go through this, and it's it's our force generation process. So in in a, in a force generation model, that, that time you spend doing readiness is in preparation for going to work for the combatant commander to be assigned to the combatant commander. And in General Chess's uh, example, you know, in the missile field, missile crews are assigned to, uh, to U.S. STRATCOM as combatant commander. In this case, uh, within Dell 9 we take our uh, operational unit, primarily in this case we'll talk about ONESOPS, the first space operations squadron. Uh, they take their their forces. They um, spend a few months doing readiness training activities, and then we present back to U.S. Space Command the first space combat squadron, and that is a, a discrete set of again personnel and resources that have been optimized through training to meet the mission of U.S. Space Command for a specific time period, and we we break that out into six month increments. So essentially, as a Delta commander and a, with my squadron commanders, we're looking six months ahead. We are determining what is the best use of our resources for training, exercises, rehearsals, inter-Delta integration. Um, so I mentioned we have a great relationship with the airmen who support us, but we also have relationships with, of course, all the other Deltas for different mission areas. And we train together and then we present that combat force to U.S. Space Command. So it's a lot of different nested activities. But again, the ultimate uh, objective is to be uh, purpose built and focused on the readiness targets that we need for U.S. Space Command to be the most combat effective uh, to be the most uh, resilient, responsive um, uh, in the in the current competitive environment uh, to deter uh, and, if necessary, to defeat uh, any potential adversary. That's that's really why we exist, and that's what we focus on. Yeah, it makes sense, and it really makes sense with the mission, the mission focus of each Delta. How you, it is a luxury to focus on that on that mission, and, and you can stay focused, and you have to. With you know, General Salzman recently talked about, hey, there's 14,000 of us in this service, mm -hmm. nine of which are wearing a uniform. Right. And you need to be focused, you need to be efficient and lethal. Um, however, there's no secret that space situational awareness versus space domain awareness has caused confusion for the sort of average space uh, enthusiast. Can you explain in your layman's terms, SDA versus SSA? And then also, how does uh, Space Delta 9, your, your command, how do you contribute to SSA? Sure. Um, so it's a great example that over the many changes we've had in the department over the years, uh, we have we have done things like change terms. SSA and SDA are situational to domain awareness. They sound very similar, um, but it's really an application of those mission areas and the way, again, we go to optimize in our force to conduct those missions. Um, so at a, at a very broad level, uh, the easiest way to think about the difference is situational awareness um, is, is, is similar to a lot of other domains. When, when you're getting situational awareness, you're seeing what's around you. You're um, and in space, what that means, especially for Del 9, since we are in orbit uh, all the time, we're observing other resident space objects. And that's literally just understanding where they are in proximity to us and to our blue assets. Um, it's, it's very uh, uh, snapshot in time, if you will. Domain awareness broadens that perspective quite a bit. So in domain awareness, we're looking at the space environment. We're looking at not just an object, but what it's doing, how it's behaving, where it's going, where it has been and where it's going. Uh, we're looking at the status of blue forces, uh, the, con the condition status of friendly allied partner resources, but also or, uh, or uh, resources, uh, but also any potential adversaries. And so it broadens your perspective quite a bit. And it, it includes um, obviously intelligence. Uh, so we have we are integrated with intelligence professionals to, to, to build our domain awareness. But as I mentioned, environmental monitoring, uh, blue force status. Um, 
a lot of predictive analysis on the, the domain that, that our satellites operate in, uh, but also understanding the domain and the environment of other users. So it's, it is really giving, um, and instead of a snapshot of time, it's giving that continuous look at how the domain is changing. Uh, and going back to our discussion on combat squadrons, when we prepare a combat squadron to go to U.S. Space Command, you know, they need to understand the area in which they're operating, their area of operations, but also the domain in which they're stepping into. So the space domain today can be different in six months. Um, we we operate a lot in the geosynchronous belt, but if you think about low Earth orbit, low Earth orbit is a, is a very busy place. You have a lot of commercial uh, operations occurring there. You have uh, civil activities. You have the advent of mega constellations with uh, with a uh, large dispersed LEO constellations. So the domains are constantly changing. Uh, again, more in LEO today than maybe GEO in the future, um, but you have to maintain that awareness at all times. And that's the biggest difference. Yeah, and, and it's, um, I think a lot of people often assume US Space Force, Space Force's space and US Space Command, that's this, uh, this, this relationship going on, but we can't forget about all the other mm -hmm. um, demands of the other combat commanders. Yes that the Space Force has a, you know, you think about a Chachi must master layer out in the PACOM AOR, sure. which everybody's talking about for a good reason these days. Um, and that's that's stretching the force thin, uh, but it's it's leaders like yourself to keep everybody focused on those combat squadrons. I think that's a good change uh, for this. You mentioned geosynchronous orbit. Mm -hmm. We can't talk about geo without talking about GSAP. Absolutely. Um, GSAP has been, it's not new. Right. It's, it's our bread and butter, but you know, the threat China, Russia in particular, our competitors, if you will, great power competition, um, they can hold these types of assets at risk. But um, can you talk about GSAP, what it means to Delta 9, mm -hmm. and how that provides capability for you? Absolutely. So as you mentioned, GSAP has been around for a while. Um, we very early on in the life of the GSAP program, uh, we, we coined the term neighborhood watch for the mission of GSAP. And specifically, because what GSAP's good at, um, and it's really designed for, is to be a, a system that operates in the geostationary belt, but not in, in a fixed sense. It is, it is walking the beat, it's the cop on the beat. It's going out to make sure, um, as we talked about the, those differences in SSA and SDA, it's not only looking out across the geo belt and understanding where resident space objects sit, where um, another satellite is operating from in the belt, uh, and that is, uh, as basic and it's what we call metric observation but it's just basically measuring its position its attitude where it's where it's pointing and we can determine that um, through through those observations um, and that is getting the continuous picture of it what's in the what's in the belt but because gsap is walking the beat it's maneuverable it can it can change its perspective it can get a different look across the belt um, but can also move through the belt and it can do, it can do additional characterization of other objects and so the the best analogy is that if you have um, you know, friendly assets, blue assets. Uh, we want to make sure that a satellite that we put on orbit, whether it was 10 years ago or 10 days ago, um, is is configured and operating just as we expect it to. So you can think of it as checking the locks on your doors to make sure everything is still still good. Um, we can also look at allied and partner systems to make sure that they are uh, they're healthy or they are oriented the way that we expect them to be. And then if you move to potential adversaries, you want to make sure that you have eyes on someone you're not sure about. Maybe you're not sure of their intent or their behavior. Uh, because we've been uh, so forthright with GSAP's mission, we can say we're going to do all those activities in a safe and responsible manner. We're going to follow norms of behavior that we hold ourselves to. But we also we portray that behavior uh, publicly so we can so others can see what we're doing so that we're showing the way that we want others to operate in the space domain. And so when we observe or characterize other systems, again, potential adversaries, if we needed to, we could attribute their behavior. Uh, we can we can let them know that we are watching, that we are we are um, able to uh, assess activities. And that all feeds into the domain awareness picture, but it goes back to our early conversation of if you're trying to develop options, if you're trying to understand how to conduct uh, uh, deterrence activities or other uh, full spectrum operations throughout all domains in from and to space, uh, you really have to understand what's happening. And that's what GSEC gives us the ability to do to a level that no other system can provide. Yeah, I think that's even huge when you think about uh, your boss, General Miller, um, recently talked about when he was the U.S. Space Command mm -hmm. J3, what were what were the big eye-opening moments for him in that role? And he, he just went immediately back to 2021 mm -hmm. when the Chinese, when you talk about m marrying up a hyperglide vehicle mm -hmm. with fractional orbital bombardment system, the two together create a huge challenge. That was 2021. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, we had the Russian direct ascent ASAT, 
where they basically shot down their own satellite, creating a debris field that we're still dealing with and will deal with forever. Um, but that is that complicates SDA space, mm -hmm. you know, domain awareness. Where do you think as it gets more contested, more congested mm -hmm. up in space, both geo, neo, and down to Leo? Mm -hmm. What are the growth areas for SDA? What is this? What does this contested and congested environment mean to SDA? Absolutely. So there's a, um, as you mentioned, there's a constantly evolving uh, environment in in all orbital regimes. You have, of course, an explosion in commercial and civil growth. You have our potential adversaries um, taking steps that uh, run counter to our, again, our safe and responsible use of space. That and we prioritize safe and responsible because we want to be able to show that space is usable for future gener generations. We want it, space to be usable for additional exploration. We want it to be used uh, for military purposes in a safe and responsible manner. Activities that run counter to that are a concern. And it's a concern, as you mentioned, from an SDA perspective, because just from a raw numbers standpoint, that is more resident space objects for systems like ours to go track. Um, there's more uh, there's more decisions that have to be made in terms of assessment and attribution. So there's there's literally more work to do as a result of some of those activities. But it's not just the raw numbers. It's also the complexity that grows from that. So space as it gets con contested, congested, uh, and more complex. Uh, we, we see growth in how do you handle large amounts of data? How do you analyze and process that data? How do you uh, make, how do you get to decision quality information from that raw data into something that you can use? Um, as my good friend, Colonel Agrawal and Del too, he would say, how do you turn that into opportunity? How do you, how do you take, um, what, uh, before was again a situational awareness watching dots to full spectrum domain awareness to decision quality information to turn into options to maintain military advantage? Because ultimately, Delta Nine and orbital warfare is there um, as a way to project combat power. Um, it's a way for the United States to demonstrate resolve, um, as General Salzman would say, to maintain competitive endurance. Uh, but you have to have all these pieces working together. You have to have the intra-Delta uh, integration. You have to have the tools, the systems, but more importantly, the personnel trained and ready to do um, work and to work these complex problems to be able to provide the options necessary. In this case, back to General Whiting as U.S. Space Command uh, to maintain. Uh, a safe and responsible, but ultimately a military effective domain. Yeah, that's, um, you know, the partnerships, we, we often talk about the coalition partners, our allies, um, but everyone from the Honorable Frank Kendall to the CSO, to General Gutwein, General Garant, um, the Honorable Frank Calvelli, mm -hmm. industry is a partner as well to the Space Force. Uh, right. When you have the 9,000 guardians wearing the uniform, there's clearly going to need some technical uh, expertise. You mm -hmm. need industry to be a no kidding partner. Mm -hmm. And while you and your current role have no procurement or acquisition authority, you could also you can always say, man, I would love to have this. Sure. And industry is always looking to help the Space Force and all the military services with technology and ideas. If there was if there was one or two things you say, hey, this would really help our nation. Yeah. This would really help space, uh, you know, Delta nine. Mm -hmm. What would those be? What can they start looking at and thinking about? Because this is this is still new with all this this competition. We're, we're going against some competitors that have huge GDPs and huge budgets as well. And every taxpayer dollar is precious. So right. from your perspective, where you sit now, where, where can industry help? No, thanks. Thanks for that question, because we do have uh, we have had for a long time incredible industry partnership. If you look to the early days of uh, how, how the U.S. has invested in space, it's been hand in glove with industry, um, not just to stay ahead of technology, but also to leverage um, the art of the possible. And industry is great for uh, a great partner for that. Um, one of the, the things I have talked often to industry about is, as I mentioned, going back to, to large, complex problem sets, is that um, things that help us uh, make decisions faster, um, to use the military parlance to, to shorten our OODA loop, to make sure that we can observe, orient, decide, and act faster. Uh, so decision support, uh, data analytics, um, being able to, to manage um, uh, the scale and complexity of not just uh, when we look at things happening on orbit, it's typically not one thing at a time. Sometimes it's simultaneity. Uh, so being able to handle um, really orbital mechanics, which is rocket science fundamentally, to do that faster uh, with humans in the loop, uh, ultimately to make better decisions. That's really where we often engage with industry on is, hey, how can we take the information we're, we're collecting, all that domain awareness information we're collecting, um, and as that, as that information continues to grow, how can we best utilize that? to make smarter decisions faster and to stay that one step ahead of any competitor. That's really where we look for more partnering. Well, before we close out today, I wanted to give you an opportunity as you, you know, you've taken command a little over a year and a half ago. So you're getting close to the two year point. 
And I just want to give you an opportunity while remaining humble, approachable, and credible, as all good weapons officers do, a chance to uh, think back on what you're proud of, where you've taken the Delta, and most importantly, where the Guardians have really excelled and advanced the ball forward. Thank you for that. Um, there, uh, I'll go back to what I said initially with orbital warfare. It's a new mission. It's a new competency for the service that we, we identified when we established the Space Force. And so really, Delta 9 and OW is only as old as the service. Uh, we have other missions in the Space Force that predated the stand-up that go all they have heritage all the way back to Air Force Space Command. Um, but the fact that OW was new meant that we had a lot of growth opportunity. Um, and I, I am most proud of our guardians and the airmen that support us to be able to seize that opportunity and to grow super fast, but to grow in a way that uh, prioritizes those same objectives of maintaining combat readiness, uh, maintaining our focus on uh, really from a warfighting perspective, the warfighting effectiveness, making sure that those options that we present back to national leadership are actually executable. That's hard uh, because we have a new mission that we don't have a lot of legacy to lean back on that they're having to create in real time. Uh, not just create the tactics, the, the the knowledge base, but we're also developing our people. We're, we're, as I mentioned, we're experimenting. We're looking at new technologies, working across the department and industry to figure out what is the what is the state of the art or the or the art of the possible, and making sure that we can uh, remain uh, competitive and and ultimately go through deterrence uh, all the way through conflict and, and win. That, that it's a tall order, um, and they've met that challenge uh, incredibly well. Um, now we still have a lot of growth left to do, um, but we have we've been able to maintain that uh, that focus on on combat readiness while also um, building a new unit, build, building a new delta, uh, uh, seizing the opportunity to create identity, to create culture. Um, there's a lot of those things that you see in the space force that um, we haven't seen uh, since the standby of the air force. You know, going going back you know to the 40s where we you know we no one had the playbook on how to stand up a service when the air force did it. We certainly didn't have a playbook when we stood up the Space Force. That You've seen elements of that across the service. You see young guardians uh, taking the initiative, um, owning their mission, owning their identity, shaping the service the, the way that they believe is best suited to the intent of, of what we're trying to do, and then moving out on that. And we we empower, I'm, I'm proud to say, all, all leaders at all levels, we empower our folks to do that, to take initiative, to own their destiny, um, not just to develop the units in the service they're sitting in, but to be the warfighter that we know that they are for the nation. And to watch that happen over the last 18 months as I am coming up, unfortunately, to the end of my command tour, uh, which is always bittersweet, um, to be able to see that happen uh, in a short period of time and the rapid growth that we've experienced, couldn't be prouder. Um, and the partnerships that they've created along the way just makes us that much stronger. So I, I'll be moving on, unfortunately, but I really look forward to seeing where Dell 9, OW heads in the future um, and all the other partners that we've made in this mission area as we continue to grow. Um, to meet Secretary Kendall's imperative of, of moving quickly. You know, we, we're out of time to make the changes we need to make, so we have to move quickly. And I know our guardians, the airmen, uh, the civilians, the contractors that support us, they're up to that task and they're ready to meet that demand. And we, we will be there. Well, on behalf of all the corporate and individual members of the Space Force Association, we not only want to thank you for your time today, but thank you for your leadership in Del Nye. We look forward to many good things to come from you as well as the orbital warfare community. So thanks for Thank you for the opportunity. All right.